Good afternoon. One element at the top, and then we'll go ahead and uh, get started with your questions. Uh, the United States is deeply concerned by Tunisian President Saeed's calls to dissolve the Supreme Judicial Council and the reported barring of employees from entering the Supreme Judicial Council. An independent judiciary is a core element of an effective and transparent democracy. It is essential that the government of Tunisia uphold its commitments to respect the independence of the judiciary as stipulated in the Constitution. The United States reiterates our calls for an accelerated political reform process in Tunisia that responds to the aspirations of the Tunisian people through the inclusion of diverse voices representing political parties, civil society, and unions, particularly in the ongoing national consultations, and that ensures the continued respect for Tunisia's human rights. At this critical time, we also urge the government of Tunisia to prioritize implementing the economic reforms required to st stabilize the financial situation and address Tunisia's growing economic challenges. Uh, with that, happy to take your questions. Matt. Thanks, Thanks Ted. Um, so I realize that Ukraine is still the flavor of the day, but I, I don't really have anything big on Ukraine. So I will, after I ask my first very brief initial question, I'll defer to others on Ukraine because I want to go to Iran. Um, I, just on, on Ukraine, um, the joint statement, I realize that in the press conference, uh, uh, the Secretary and Mr. Borrell spoke about Russia, but I'm just wondering why there was no mention of Russia at all in the joint statement from the EU-US Energy Council meeting. I mean, it wasn't, the word wasn't even in there. Well, uh, the word Ukraine certainly was. Well, uh, there, was, a, yes, it was there was a robust discussion of uh, Ukraine. There was a robust discussion uh, of uh, the contingency planning uh, that we're doing in the event that uh, Russia does not choose the path of diplomacy, does not choose the path uh, of dialogue. And as the joint statement uh, noted, uh, the council reiterated that it is unacceptable to use energy supplies as a weapon or geopolitical lever. Uh, this is what we have been saying all along, uh, and much of the discussion today between the secretary and between the, the high representative uh, was uh, part and parcel of the contingency planning uh, okay. that we've been doing for some time now. But what, I mean, was there a reason that Russia is not mentioned in there? I mean, presumably, yes, it's obvious that, uh, the, the, that the threat to European energy security is coming from Russia. They're the main supplier, and this is, but... I'm just wondering why it wasn't mentioned. Was there some objection to it being I, mentioned? I, I, or was I am, it, did it ever come up in the discussion? I, I, am, I am not aware there right. was any substantive reason for it. All right, I, then I will, I will, I will um, pass. And okay. I, but I do want to, I have a couple important ones on Iran. I'm sure we'll get there. Definitely. Are in Europe this week coordinating sanctions and export control measures that can be used in the event that Russia invades Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Is the U.S. looking for commitments from counterparts during this trip on what action will be taken if Russia invades, and will Nord, Nord Stream 2 be part of discussions? Uh, so, Daphne, what we uh, spoke about uh, earlier was the fact that we continue to uh, take part in robust and to lead robust coordination and consultation uh, with our European partners and allies. Uh, on the consequences that would befall Moscow if it chooses the path of, uh, of aggression. Uh, we've been consulting very closely with our allies and our partners uh, over the course, not of weeks, but really of months now. Um, uh, and that includes the, the package uh, that would respond to Russian aggression. And so as you alluded to today, uh, a U.S. delegation that included officials from Treasury and from the Department of State uh, including the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes, Elizabeth Rosenberg, Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration, uh, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Rosamund Kindler, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, here at the State Department, Molly uh, Montgomery, uh, traveling to Europe to discuss technical uh, coordination. So over the past uh, several weeks and even longer, uh, we've discussed at a strategic level uh, what we would, what the consequences uh, that would befall uh, Moscow were it, choose, were it to choose this path. Uh, there have been very detailed uh, discussions in the, in the context of that. Uh, beyond uh, the, uh, the, the broad top lines, uh, there are a myriad of um, uh, details and technical matters uh, that will need to be worked out uh, if we are in the unfortunate position of having to move forward with this uh, strong and unified response. 
And so what, you, uh, what our uh, team from the State Department, from the Department of Commerce, from the Department of the Treasury are doing uh, is meeting with uh, their con counterparts and European interlocutors uh, to have those, uh, to continue, I should say, those technical discussions uh, to ensure that across the board uh, we're ready to go should, again, we be in the, the unfortunate position of needing to mobilize this response. And will Nord Stream 2 be a part of that? Well, uh, I don't know if they'll be part of these specific discussions. What I can say is that, uh, of course, the President is meeting with Chancellor Schultz today uh, at the White House leading up to this meeting. Uh, we have had a number of discussions uh, with our uh, German allies uh, on uh, energy security broadly, uh, on Nord Stream 2 specifically, um, uh, both in the context of uh, what we're seeing from Russia uh, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Thank yes. Thank you, Nick. Uh, good to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions on South Korea, China, and North Korea. Uh, first of all, uh, on South Korea, South Korea government frequently fails to participate in the UN Security Council statement condemning North Korea's missile provocation or ignore North Korea's human rights issues. How does the U.S. evaluate South Korea's attitude? The second one on, on the China. Uh, after the UN Security Council meeting last week, the Chinese ambassador to the UN has blamed United States for the recent missile launch by North Korea. As you know, the South Korea is, and I'm sorry, uh, he is insisted that the U.S. should take a more flexible approach. As you know, South North Korea and uh, China and Russia are strategically the same body. What is the United States position on China justifying North Korea's missile provocation? So let me take your uh, first question first. Uh, as you know, uh, since the start of this administration, we have been investing heavily uh, in our alliances and partnerships uh, around the globe, and of course that includes in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, there are a number of shared challenges and shared opportunities we have with our allies in the Indo-Pacific, of course our treaty allies, uh, Japan and, and the ROK, uh, among them, and uh, among those challenges are the DPRK, uh, maybe one of the more, certainly is one of the more pressing challenges uh, we have uh, with uh, those allies. Uh, in recent days, uh, the Deputy Secretary, the, our Special Representative for the DPRK, Sung Kim, uh, they have uh, engaged their South Korean, their ROK, and Japanese counterparts. And as, as I think you know, uh, this evening we'll be departing for Australia, uh, where we will see uh, our uh, Japanese counterparts in the context of uh, the Quad. There will be a bilateral engagement there. Uh, before we then uh, go by way of Fiji to uh, Hawaii, where we'll engage uh, in a trilateral uh, discussion with our South Korean and Japanese counterparts. Uh, and uh, I think you, I can be confident that one of the uh, priority issues of discussion in that setting uh, will, will be the recent provocations we've seen from the DPRK, including uh, its missile launches. Uh, we know that uh, when it comes to the fulfillment uh, and uh, the achievement of any progress towards our overriding goal, uh, one of the indispensable ingredients is close coordination with our allies and partners. Uh, and the Japan, uh, Japan and ROK uh, are, of course, uh, uh, two of our allies with whom we work with um, most closely on this challenge. Uh, we know that that bilateral coordination is important, but we also know that trilateral uh, coordination between the United States, Japan, and the ROK uh, really is and will be uh, indispensable if we are to uh, achieve progress. It's also a priority uh, for uh, our allies, Japan and the ROK, uh, because of the threat that the DPRK poses, uh, not only to uh, Americans in the region, potentially to deployed forces, uh, but also to our treaty allies, uh, Japan and the ROK. So it's something we take extraordinarily, extraordinarily seriously, uh, and we know they do as well. When it comes to, uh, and this gets to your second question, our approach uh, to the DPRK. Uh, look, if you want to um, assign responsibility for the, D for the DPRK's provocations, for uh, the uh, um, 
potential threats to international peace and security we've seen emanate from the DPRK. Uh, the only party that deserves uh, blame, the only party uh, that uh, can be assigned culpability is the DPRK. Uh, we have made very clear that we have no hostile intent towards the DPRK. Uh, we have made very clear that we wish to engage in dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, we have made very clear that uh, we believe that only through dialogue and diplomacy can we most effectively achieve what, again, is our overriding policy objective, and that's the complete denuclearization uh, of the Korean Peninsula. Follow-up quick question. So North Korea has been engaged uh, in peace process dialogue with the United States and South Korea in the past, while on the other hand, it has been ex accelerating its has been a North Korea military build-up work. What is the ultimate tool for the United States besides diplomatic compromise to block North Korea global threat? Well, the ultimate tool is diplomacy. Uh, and we know that uh, previous administrations have tried this. Uh, no administration has been successful uh, despite undertaking strategies uh, that in many cases uh, look uh, very different uh, from one another. Uh, and so the strategy we have uh, is not akin to the strategy that the last administration had. Uh, it is not uh, also exactly akin to the strategy that uh, the Obama administ administration had. Uh, it is a strategy that the Biden-Harris administration has put forward uh, after an intense policy review and a policy review that determined that uh, through diplomacy and dialogue, uh, it is our hope that there can be incremental progress, uh, incremental progress towards the complete denuclearization uh, of the Korean Peninsula. Now, uh, of course, we have not yet found uh, a willing partner in Pyongyang uh, to engage uh, in that dialogue, but we have continued, uh, even in the absence of substantive engagement from uh, the DPRK, uh, to coordinate closely with uh, Japan, with the ROK, other uh, allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but also uh, allies and partners around the world, uh, which you have seen us do in the UN, which you've seen us do in Europe uh, and elsewhere as we uh, take on this challenge site. Thank you. Thank you. Can I go to the council Sure. I have a couple of uh, questions on sector violence on, on, on Omar Assad. Um, uh, but before that, uh, the White House uh, issued a statement saying that President Biden is going to go and visit Israel later this year. Is he likely to also go? I mean, I know this is a White House probably question, but do you think that he will also make a, a detour to, you know, like Bethlehem or Ramallah, 20 minutes away? Well, Saeed, as you alluded to, the readout of the conversation mm -hmm. between President right. Biden and uh, Prime Minister Bennett uh, did make a reference to President mm -hmm. Biden's intent uh, to mm -hmm. travel to uh, the region later this year. Obviously, mm -hmm. this was just right. announced yesterday, so I wouldn't want to right. uh, get into the itinerary at this point. Okay. In any case, I need to refer you to the White House. I understand. Uh, Ned, I mean, you know, you almost every week you, you state uh, you know, opposition or displeasure with settler violence activities and so on. I mean, in the last four days, I could cite a number of issues. I don't want to go through them all. I mean, for, uh, the Israelis from home demolishing to attacks on the Aqsa Mosque to poisoning of wells. I mean, all kinds of things, all gam across the gamut. Why would you guys issue a very strong statement and say, this should not stand? I mean, if you want, if you want to give the two-state solution, as you keep saying, a chance, then should stop right now, this, this stuff. Saeed, I would take issue with the premise of your question. We have spoken spoken to this uh, clearly and I understand that you spoke, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know, you speak all the time. I said that to begin with, but you, what action are you taking to make sure that what you say is actually listened to and adhered to? Well, first of all, it is important uh, what we say. Uh, and you have, as you alluded to, you've heard me say this, uh, including in, in recent days. But uh, we have been very clear. Uh, we've been very consistent on this. We believe it is absolutely critical uh, for all parties to refrain from steps that exacerbate tensions. Uh, this includes uh, violence, incitement to violence, home, dis home demolitions, uh, the eviction of families from homes in East Jerusalem, uh, including uh, families um, uh, that have lived there for generations. Uh, that includes the destruction of property uh, and for providing compensation for individuals imprisoned uh, for acts of terrorism. All of these things move us further away uh, from what continues to be uh, our uh, desired in-state, uh, and that is a two-state solution. 
uh, a two-state solution that continues to be in the best interests uh, of Israel, of the uh, uh, Palestinian people, uh, and something that successive American administrations have supported. Now, one last question on Omar Assad, the Palestinian-American who died in Israeli custody. I know that last Tuesday, you guys issued a statement. Has anything transpired since then? Have the Israelis come forward to you? Are you completely satisfied? Or are you still asking for more accountability? Because apparently those who did it, you know, they were sort of slapped on the wrist. Well, we did issue a statement on this uh, yesterday. That uh, statement spoke of our uh, concern, but it also spoke of our ongoing dialogue uh, with our Israeli partners on this. We did. We issued one on uh, February 1st, I believe. Yeah, not yesterday. Yes, sorry, did I say yesterday? Yes, we yes, issued it last week. Last I'm sorry. Tuesday, last week. Yes, we yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sure. Yeah, when you're going to have the, the formal response from Moscow and when there is an again, engage, new engagement with the um, Foreign Minister Lavrov, how do you know? We, we don't have any updates on that. As I uh, conveyed last week, the Secretary had an opportunity to speak to Foreign Minister Lavrov. It was our understanding uh, following that engagement that the Russians were working on a response to uh, our so-called non-paper, a response that uh, would be uh, sent to and approved, presumably, by uh, Vladimir Putin before uh, it would be transmitted back uh, to us. Uh, that has uh, not yet happened. Uh, it was also our understanding that once that did happen, uh, that uh, the Russians would be prepared to engage uh, in follow-on diplomacy, uh, but again, uh, will need to, um, the first step in that was receiving uh, the Russian response, which has not yet happened. And do you expect that the uh, follow-up uh, engagement can happen while the Secretary is traveling, or more probably when he comes back from his travel? We don't have any additional details to share in terms of timing, in terms of uh, format, uh, or the mode for that uh, engagement, so I'd hesitate to get ahead of it. Ben? Uh, uh, I'm trying to make sure, I, I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to make sure about the uh, and without getting into the whole back and forth that happened last week. Uh, I don't know what you're, you're talking about, Matt. Your, <laughs> no, nor do I. Uh, your, 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 uh, your belief that the, the, there is some Russian false flag operation that's being planned has not changed, right, since, since last Thursday? Uh, is that correct? That is correct. That and is correct. Do you, are you prepared today to offer any additional? What, what I am prepared to do today uh, is to explain um, what I um, perhaps inartfully uh, tried to do uh, last week in explaining um, what it is we're trying to do uh, and why uh, we're not able to uh, provide a, a full set of information or at least um, all of the information that, that you and your colleagues um, may ask for. Um, the Secretary spoke uh, to this briefly earlier today, but this gets to uh, our bottom line proposition. We believe that the best antidote to disinformation uh, is information. Uh, and that is why you have seen us employ uh, concerted uh, efforts across the board. We want to go the extra mile to ensure that, uh, again, to the extent possible, the American people uh, and people around the world have an understanding uh, of what we know and what undergirds our concern uh, for the threat that Moscow poses. Now, an element of that has been our declassification of information, uh, including intelligence information, uh, that is in uh, our possession. And as you heard me say last week, uh, we've done that with two overriding objectives in mind. Uh, the first, and of course our preference, is to be in a position to deter the Russians from uh, going forward. Uh, we want, by exposing this information uh, and making sure that Moscow knows what we know, uh, to have them think uh, twice or many more times uh, before uh, moving forward uh, with such a reckless action. If we're not able to do that, if we're not able to deter uh, a further invasion uh, or aggression against Ukraine, uh, we at least want to be in the position of having let the world know that despite the disinformation, despite uh, the propaganda and lies that presumably Moscow will say after the fact, uh, that the world will know what we knew all along. And that is the fact that Moscow sought to fabricate a pretext for this aggression, very similar to what they did uh, in 2014. Uh, Matt, you know uh, that in 2014, uh, the Russians uh, went into uh, Ukraine, sent their proxy forces into 
uh, Ukraine, claiming that Russians were under threat, uh, claiming that a three-year-old boy had been crucified, uh, claiming that uh, they had no choice uh, but to do so. Uh, again, this is why we are so concerned uh, about what we are seeing now and what we know now. Now, in, in taking this approach, uh, we recognize uh, that the information that we're able to put forward will necessarily be limited. Uh, and it will be limited for uh, a reason that you also know well. Uh, again, we even as we seek to expose Moscow's efforts, we don't want to jeopardize or potentially jeopardize our ability to collect this kind of information going forward. But when we do the cost-benefit analysis uh, and we uh, consider um, if the choice is between putting forward necessarily incomplete, sometimes broad, sometimes general information in an attempt to deter aggression, or on the other hand, uh, if the choice is to keep that to ourselves uh, and potentially not play every card available to us, that's not a difficult choice. Again, we are doing this in an effort to, in the first instance, deter, if we're not able to do that, to expose uh, what Moscow has um, had in mind all along. We want to see this crisis resolved peacefully. We want to see this crisis resolved diplomatically. Uh, and we will do everything we responsibly can, we can uh, responsible in terms of tactics, but also responsible in terms of uh, our national security and our ability to continue to benefit from this information uh, going forward uh, to bring about what we hope is a diplomatic outcome. Okay, well, I'm not gonna go into detail. What, like, what, like I did last week, but the, the bottom line is that no, you're not prepared to share any and any of the information that you have that would suggest that this is actually correct. Well, is that, uh, is that right? Again, we, we have shared significant information. No, no, and, 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 and said I didn't want to get back into this. Do you have anything more that you can say to beyond, back up the claim than you did than you had to say last beyond, week? Beyond beyond what we told you last week in no. pretty detailed terms okay. about uh, the Russian plans, we don't have anything okay. further to and, offer on that. Uh, okay, and then and then the proof. Then you're saying, hold on, say just the last one. The the, the proof that you're correct. Is that nothing is actually going to happen? Is that what you're saying? No, I, I that, it's because not. Because you that's not, will have you could because you putting this out there will have stopped. No, I, 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 what I said is right? that our our overriding objective in the first instance is to deter Russian aggression. Uh, that is why we are doing uh, a number of things. Entirely only about this alleged false flag operation that you're talking about. You're saying that the proof that there is a false flag operation is going to come when nothing actually happens. I did not say that, Matt. I said well, that our overriding like objective is to deter Russian aggression against Ukraine, further right. Russian <laughs> aggression uh, against Ukraine. I, I acknowledge I will probably never be able to, well, I will certainly never be able to give you the proof that you, I'm sure, want. Uh, but <laughs> we are doing this. We are doing this, not in an effort, I'm sorry to say, uh, to satisfy you, but in an effort to <laughs> prevent and deter an invasion. It's not really uh, about satisfying me, but it, anyway, the, I, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to take can, up. Can you clarify something? I'm just Please. So you think that the Russians are still scheming to do this today with the same intensity as they were last week? I, I, I not in a or, position or to to recruit? give you an update on on this specific scheme, uh, but I think our concerns. Uh, about the Russians potentially resorting to these tactics, the same sort of false flag tactics they, that they have, uh, that they did resort to uh, in the past, uh, those concerns are still very present. Okay, you know, one gets the impression that an attack or a, an invasion is, is imminent. You know, it's just a question of time, maybe a few days, mid-month, whatever. You know, so on the scale of one to ten, I know you guys like this. What what is the likelihood of the invasion? Is it about seven? Is it about eight? Are we today closer to nine, let's say, than we were last week? I, I am going to refer you to Vladimir Putin. Again, uh, we have put forward these two paths. Uh, it is our strong, strong preference that we pursue the path of diplomacy and dialogue. What I will say, and what you heard the National Security Advisor speak to yesterday, yeah. uh, is that we are now in the window, given what we have seen from the Russians over uh, weeks and even longer now, amassing uh, troops along Ukraine's borders, uh, dispatching forces 
uh, into Belarus, uh, taking other steps that have positioned them uh, to move forward uh, at any moment, if they so choose. Uh, we do not yet believe that Vladimir Putin has made a decision. It is our goal in all of this, including what I was discussing with Matt just a moment ago, to deter an invasion. Uh, if we're not able to deter an invasion, uh, we will then resort to the other path. Uh, it's a path of uh, hefty, stark consequences uh, for Russia. It's also a path uh, of defense for uh, our allies on the eastern flank of NATO. Are you aware of reports where a high-level Russian officer, you know, or the head of the officer's school, whatever it is, warned Putin against the invasion of Ukraine? I, I've seen uh, these reports. I understand that there was an open letter, uh, right. and so uh, I've certainly seek that, uh, seen that. Uh, again, I don't have a specific comment on it. Uh, our goal is to solve conflicts through uh, diplomacy. Uh, we're seeking to do that for the good of the American people, uh, the good of the Ukrainian people, the good of the Russian people, uh, and people all uh, throughout Europe, knowing uh, that any uh, renewed invasion of Ukraine would carry tremendous costs, uh, tremendous costs uh, across many realms. It's our goal to uh, do everything we can to avoid that. Yes, Ben. Uh, you just said in uh, your answer to Matt that if you have to put forward incomplete information to deter an attack, then so be it. What were you referring to there? I mean, is intelligence behind this video perhaps incomplete? No, I was referring to the fact that there have been demands uh, for uh, everything we have in our possession uh, behind uh, this intelligence. And that's not something we're able to provide, again, because of our desire uh, not to jeopardize sources and methods, well, our desire not to jeopardize. To me, that's not true. I ask for literally, quote unquote, any shred of evidence, not even proof, because not all evidence is proof. I asked for anything. I didn't ask for everything. I didn't ask for sources or message, methods. I just <laughs> I, I think anything the, that would back it up. The challenge, Absolutely. Matt, the challenge, Matt, is that by divulging details, uh, further details, you would necessarily get into sources and methods. Uh, and so that is why we're in the position of putting forward what we know in a way that we consider to be responsible vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our uh, objectives going forward. And one of those objectives going forward uh, is to protect our ability uh, to collect this kind of information uh, going forward. We are trying to strike a very difficult balance. Uh, there are, uh, when it comes to national security uh, and the tension, the apparent tension between national security and transparency, uh, there is never an easy formula. Uh, not always do we get it right. No administration has always gotten it right. Uh, but we are leaning forward here. Uh, the only reason we're having this discussion is because we publicized some of what was in our possession. We could have kept that to ourselves. Uh, it would have uh, made for a much less memorable briefing uh, last Thursday, uh, but that wasn't the responsible thing in our estimation to do. Again, we want to make sure at the end of the day, whether we are able to deter an invasion or whether in the aftermath of an invasion, that we have done everything we responsibly can uh, to do that. And one of the tactics we've used, one of the tactics I would say we've used probably more so than previous administrations, is declassifying information or making public information uh, that previously was not public. Uh, that is not something that, um, it is not something that um, administrations have done, certainly to this, to this degree. You also say that we're in the window now where an attack might happen. You said that repeatedly that an attack is imminent. Uh, with we've that never said repeatedly that an attack is imminent. We, we have said that we are now in the window uh, where if, we have said that if Vladimir Putin decides to move, I can't be accountable for what, for what others write. What we have said, what we have said is that if Vladimir Putin decides to go forward with an invasion, they have now positioned themselves uh, to the degree that they're able to do that, uh, whether it is uh, within a day, within a couple weeks. They have now reached that point. But imminent suggests that this is a foregone conclusion, that this is a certainty. Uh, so No one in the administration has used the word imminent? I, I think what you might have heard is potentially imminent. Uh, that, that, uh, what, what, if an invasion were imminent, we would not be prioritizing diplomacy and dialogue the way we have. 
eminence suggests that this is a foregone conclusion, yeah, like that there is no way to avoid it. Uh, I think if you've been listening to what we've been saying for the past two months now, the emphasis we placed on dialogue and diplomacy, the emphasis that we placed on deterring an invasion, uh, the emphasis that we have placed on finding a diplomatic way out of this, uh, you would understand that we're not talking about something that is a foregone conclusion. Uh, we are talking about something that is one of two paths. We've consistently talked about one of two paths. It's certainly possible that Vladimir Putin will choose that path. Uh, it is our hope that he will choose the path of diplomacy and dialogue, that we can avoid the bloodshed, that we can avoid the violence, that we can avoid uh, the destabilizing forces that would descend not only on Ukraine, but well beyond uh, in terms of the implications. My question was actually going to be, considering that we are in that window now and there's talk of a potentially imminent invasion, was there ever a discussion about postponing the Australia trip? Is now the right time to be crossing the world, um, you know, going to Fiji when this invasion could happen at any time? Ben, uh, we are a big country. Uh, we are a big department. Uh, we have a lot of challenges on our plate. The Secretary of State is the Secretary of State wherever in the world he is. He has access to secure communications wherever in the world uh, he is. He, I'm sure, uh, will be uh, focused uh, to a large degree on this challenge, even while he is in the Indo-Pacific. It will certainly come up uh, in conversations with uh, counterparts in the Quad uh, and elsewhere, but I can assure you, uh, you will also see that he uh, will remain active on the phones uh, with our interagency counterparts. Uh, he and we are capable uh, of, uh, again, not to use an overused metaphor, but of walking and chewing gum at the same time. Sorry, yes, but the secretary, said, and juggling. the secretary said that uh, Ukraine is prepared to give special status in the Donbass region. Uh, he was referring to the, he was referring to... Uh, is that like, you know, sort of walking back from the SRC? No, it was, it is reiterating what's in the Minsk agreements. Uh, the Minsk agreements uh, spell out uh, a means by which to de-escalate uh, the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Special status is uh, a term that's used in uh, the Minsk agreements. about this false flag operation and then there were the assessments leaked over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, the Ukrainian foreign minister tweeted today, do not believe the apocalyptic predictions. Different capitals are calculating different scenarios. Is he wrong that there isn't this sort of apocalyptic situation that, that you all are, are discussing? We see eye to eye with our Ukrainian partners in the sense that now is not the time for panic. Uh, what we are calling for, what we are doing, uh, is moving forward with preparation. We want to be prepared, and we need to position ourselves to be prepared, uh, regardless of which path it is that Vladimir Putin takes. It's our hope that we pursue that of dialogue and diplomacy. It is certainly possible uh, that we are not able to deter an invasion, and not able to deter renewed aggression, uh, and that we'll have to be prepared for that path of defense and deterrence. But, I mean, you say that you're seeing eye to eye. He's saying that what you're saying is wrong. I don't think you've heard us use the term uh, cataclysmic, uh, if, that's, uh, uh, if, if that was the quote, but he, but apocalyptic. He was, he was specifically referring to what U.S. officials have said in recent days in the last week. I, I, the Ukrainian ambassador to Washington has spoken to this. President Zelensky uh, has spoken to uh, our coordination uh, with the uh, Ukrainian government. Uh, what we are doing is engaged in prudent preparation. Uh, we are doing that with uh, our European allies, but also uh, with our Ukrainian partners. When the Secretary and Foreign Minister Kuleba spoke on Friday, did the Foreign Minister express any of his, these concerns to the Secretary? Uh, again, we issued a readout of that call, so I don't have anything to add beyond that, uh, beyond that readout. Uh, we have a close relationship uh, with Ukraine. Ukraine, of course, is a, is a close partner of ours. We can speak uh, candidly uh, with close partners uh, when it comes to uh, our concerns. Uh, our Ukrainian partners, our European allies, and others. Uh, they know uh, of the basis uh, for our concerns. Number one, uh, they hear uh, what we say publicly in the same way you do, um, but we are also in a position to share some of that underlying information uh, with our European allies, with other allies, as well as with our Ukrainian partners. There's one last question on this. Uh, during, in the Ukrainian readout as well, it said that the Secretary reaffirmed the U.S. was working to provide additional uh, economic assistance to the Ukrainian government. Can you say anything more about that? What's on the table and a dollar amount or if anything is forthcoming? Well, uh, so we have said uh, for some time now that even as we work uh, to provide Ukraine with uh, security assistance, 
uh, we know that uh, this certainly Russian aggression, even the threat uh, of Russian aggression, uh, could have a toll on Ukraine's economy. Uh, so we have provided half a billion dollars uh, in development and humanitarian assistance in the past year. Uh, we are exploring additional macroeconomic support to help Ukraine's economy uh, amidst pressure resulting from Russia's military buildup. Last week on February 3rd, uh, we and several of our allies and partners announced a new partnership fund for a resilient Ukraine. It's a fund that bolsters uh, the resilience and perseverance of communities in eastern Ukraine, uh, those communities that, um, uh, that are uh, in some ways bearing the brunt, have borne the brunt of uh, Russia's aggression. Uh, USAID has an uh, uh, expert in the country who's monitoring the situation closely, uh, coordinating with other donors, assessing the evolving humanitarian needs of the Ukrainian people and liaising uh, with partners to ensure that they're able to rapidly scale up uh, assistance should the need arrive, arise. Uh, over the past year, uh, we in Ukraine have finalized a memorandum of understanding on commercial cooperation. It's a memorandum uh, MOU designed uh, to facilitate uh, commercial participation by U.S. companies across the Ukrainian economy uh, and by Ukrainian companies here in the United States. Uh, and then finally, uh, Exim, the Export-Import Bank, uh, has made available $3 billion in support for projects in Ukraine. Uh, and the DFC, the Development Finance Corporation, has a current investment portfolio in Ukraine of approximately $800 million across more than a dozen projects. Uh, those range from renewable energy uh, to higher education and access to financing for small and medium-sized enterprises. Rosalind, sure. I'm take off my mask because I can't hear when I wear this. Um, you keep talking about we want to resolve this diplomatically. There are reports that the Ukrainians have asked the U.S. to station some THAAD anti-missile systems in the eastern part of the country, ostensibly to guard against any Russian missile attacks. Um, the U.K. has decided to deploy 350 Royal Marines to Poland. Are these kinds of actions the thing that the West wants to be telegraphing if it wants Moscow to actually resolve all of these issues about Ukraine and about NATO's posture. You know, I mean, how does that, how does, you know, moving troops and possibly stationing anti-missile systems actually get you what you want? Sure. Uh, so I can't speak to moves that haven't been announced that are hypothetical uh, that may not uh, come to pass. But what I can speak to is, is what we've announced. And everything we have announced has been in the vein of defense and deterrence across the board, whether it is our security assistance for Ukraine, the $650 million that was provided last year, that is defensive uh, security assistance, whether it is uh, the authorization for our NATO allies to pass U.S. origin material uh, to Ukraine, that is defensive uh, material. When it comes to uh, the service members who have been put on heightened state of uh, readiness, should they be called upon, uh, by the North Atlantic Council, uh, that would be in the vein of defense and deterrence. When it comes to the service members uh, who are uh, being sent to offer reassurance uh, and um, uh, sent to uh, deter further Russian aggression against, uh, or Russian aggression, I should say, against NATO's uh, eastern flank, that is done in the vein of defense and deterrence. Uh, everything we are doing is in an effort to see to it that we are not faced uh, with a renewed Russian invasion, uh, that Russian aggression uh, does not move forward. Now, we are doing all of this also knowing uh, that in the end, Vladimir Putin may choose the path of, uh, of conflict, of an invasion, of renewed aggression. But we are doing, as I was saying to Matt and to, to others earlier, everything we can uh, in an effort to, in the first instance, deter, uh, but also to send a very clear signal uh, that we stand by our commitments under Article 5 when it comes to uh, protecting our NATO allies, uh, that um, uh, the United States uh, will live up to uh, its obligations. The United States uh, will continue to provide the sort of defensive uh, security assistance that uh, Ukraine needs to defend itself. But deploying a THAAD system is a pretty serious deal. I mean, think about the controversy in, in Korea where they have asked for the systems and it's engendered a lot of 
uproar as well as criticism from Pyongyang. I, again, and, I, I can't speak to measures that haven't been announced or that remain hypothetical. Yeah. Um, let me also ask you about Macron's meeting with Putin today. What sense does the U.S. have about what Macron was going to try to bring up once the cameras left the meeting room? Has Ambassador Sullivan and his team been able to get a readout from the French on how willing Putin is to back away in this crisis? Well, when it comes to the engagement of our partners, let me make the, the broader point that over the past month plus, we have heard from uh, our European allies, we've heard from our Ukrainian partners, we've heard from others, uh, an appreciation for what the United States uh, has been doing uh, with Russia diplomatically, and that includes in our bilateral engagement. Uh, and in expressing that appreciation uh, and understanding, we've heard from our allies and partners uh, that they have taken that approach because we have done all of this in a manner that is thoroughly coordinated, uh, that has been uh, consultative in its approach uh, with our allies and partners, and that is conducted uh, in full transparency with them. Uh, nothing about without is not just a mantra uh, for us. It is the guiding principle uh, in terms of how we have conducted ourselves, uh, including in this uh, in our bilateral engagements uh, with Russia. So similarly, we would welcome <coughs> any diplomatic efforts that are conducted in a similar manner uh, that have the potential excuse me, to de-escalate the crisis uh, that Moscow has needlessly precipitated. Uh, when it comes to the French, as you know, uh, President Biden yesterday uh, had an opportunity to speak to President Macron. This would be his second conversation with uh, the French president in, uh, in several days. Uh, Secretary Blinken yesterday uh, mm -hmm. spoke to the foreign minister, uh, Foreign Minister Le Drian. Uh, we are well coordinated across the board, uh, and that includes uh, with the French, with Paris. Uh, the result of all of this is that uh, the message President Putin is hearing from the United States, from NATO, uh, from our allies and partner, partners, it is, it is loud uh, and it is singular. Uh, and that is the fact that a diplomatic solution is the only responsible path. Uh, but again, if Russia chooses otherwise, uh, we will be prepared. We will be prepared with a response that is swift, severe, and united. I saw um, President Macron made uh, comments uh, just before he left. You will hear those same messages uh, from uh, the French president. And is the U.S. confident that once Chancellor Schultz goes to Moscow next week, that that same unified message is going to be delivered because Germany is in a slightly different position than other countries in Europe? Well, as luck would have it, Chancellor Schultz is in uh, Washington today. He's at the White House today. But I should say this is not luck. Uh, the fact that uh, Chancellor Schultz uh, is here to have these consultations with President Biden, a follow-on uh, to the consultations and the discussions that the two leaders have had uh, over the phone and over video conference in, in recent weeks, uh, this is a testament to the close and continued coordination and cooperation uh, with our European allies across the board, <coughs> board excuse me, uh, including, of course, uh, with with Germany. So I suspect you'll be hearing a lot more about that today from the President and the Chancellor. Yes, in the back. Yeah. I'd like to ask about the proximity of uh, Vladimir Putin and Latin America. So last week, uh, the Argentinian President Alberto Fernandez was uh, in Moscow, and in the coming days, the Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro will be there. Mm -hmm. And there are reports in Brazil about the fact that the U U.S. is putting pressure on Bolsonaro to cancel his trip to Russia. I would like you to elaborate a bit about the concerns and the reasons why the U.S. wants Brazil to skip this trip to Russia, and uh, if the U.S. has the same confidence that uh, you talked about France, that you are well coordinated when we are talking about the Brazilian visit to Moscow. Uh, well, we engage with our uh, Brazilian partners on uh, at, at, at multiple levels uh, regularly. Uh, we're of course aware of uh, the reports of uh, President Bolsonaro's uh, travel plans. Uh, we and many other nations around the world, uh, including in this hemisphere, are uh, deeply concerned about the potentially destabilizing role uh, that Russia is playing and its ongoing threat to uh, sovereignty and to territorial integrity, including, of course, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, as democratic countries, the United States, Brazil, um, Argentina, uh, others in, in the region and beyond, we have a responsibility to stand up uh, for democratic principles uh, and for the rules-based uh, order. 
this is the same order that has uh, undergirded unprecedented levels of stability, of security, of prosperity uh, over the past 70 years. And that is true, it is equally true in Europe as it is in the Western Hemisphere, uh, as it is uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so um, we know that uh, Brazil and, and other countries in, in the region, you mentioned Argentina as well, uh, we share values. Uh, that is one of uh, the hallmarks uh, of our relationship. Uh, and um, we have, uh, we know that uh, those values uh, will be conveyed and will undergird concerns uh, that President Putin hears, not only from the United States, but our partners around the world. But what, what does the U.S. expect from this Brazilian visit to Moscow? Uh, it's, not, it's not for us to speak to uh, what uh, the, the goals that uh, the President Bolsonaro may have in mind. Uh, I, I am confident that there will be uh, discussions uh, both before and after the trip with our Brazilian partners. Yes. Thank you. What actions will the United States take against the China for this? Sorry, uh, could you clarify the, the question? Yeah, China pledged uh, to support Russia's invasion <coughs> of Ukraine as well as North Korea. What actions ah. will the United States take against China? Well, uh, so if you're asking about the, the relationship um, between uh, Russia and China, I know that this is something that our Assistant Secretary for um, uh, uh, Asia and Pacific Affair Affairs, uh, Dan Crittenbrink, spoke to uh, last week. Um, but what we have seen over the course, not of days, not of weeks, uh, but of years and probably longer, uh, is uh, an approach that both of these countries have uh, taken for some time, and that is uh, an increasing closeness uh, between Russia uh, and China. It would be our hope, uh, given the uh, implications of uh, a renewed Russian aggression and certainly Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, that the PRC would have taken advantage of um, dialogue, of this relationship, uh, to encourage Rus Russia uh, to pursue uh, the course of diplomacy uh, and de-escalation. This is what uh, the world expects of responsible powers. Uh, the Secretary had a conversation with uh, Foreign Minister Wong of the PRC uh, the other week, the other day I should say, uh, and there was a, a discussion uh, of the potential for renewed Russian aggression, renewed Russian invasion, uh, of Ukraine and the fact that it would not only have implications in Ukraine, not only in Europe, uh, but in many ways uh, it would be a threat to peace and security around the world uh, because it would be a flagrant uh, violation of the same rules-based international order that applies equally uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, as it does uh, in Europe. If in the end China is seen as having supported uh, Russia's move uh, to choose uh, conflict or war over diplomacy, it will cost China in terms of how it's seen uh, in the eyes of the world. Uh, it will have an effect on uh, the PRC's uh, global reputation. Uh, we, as Russia and China, talk about a singular partnership. We are focused with our 29 NATO allies, we are working with the EU. We are working with our allies in the Indo-Pacific and uh, partners around the world to uh, not only uh, incentivize and to, uh, 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 to work towards a diplomatic resolution, uh, but also to be in a position to respond decisively if Russia uh, does choose the path of aggression. Uh, we told you uh, last month, uh, uh, we listed out many of the engagements that we've had with uh, partners and allies. Uh, that tally has now grown to some 200 uh, phone calls, in-person meetings, uh, video uh, conferences. Uh, of course, one of them you saw today uh, when Secretary Blinken uh, hosted uh, High Representative Joseph Borrell of the EU. All right, thank you. Yes. The Security Council that cyber attacks on cryptocurrency exchanges and financial institutions by North Korea 
were an important revenue source for North Korea to fund its nuclear and ballistic missile programs. What is the United States doing to try and stop this? And does the U.S. believe North Korea is re receiving any outside help to help carry out these cyber attacks? I don't have any assessments to offer from here in terms of outside support or assistance uh, that North Korea may be receiving. Uh, what I can say generally without um, uh, speaking to any uh, specific uh, report at this time is that North Korea's uh, activity and behavior in cyberspace has long been uh, a serious concern of the United States. Uh, we have in the past uh, disclosed and attributed uh, malicious attacks uh, to the DPRK, the attack uh, in 2014, I believe it was, that the DPRK perpetrated against a private American company, a destructive attack uh, against Sony, uh, may be uh, a, uh, an instructive case in point uh, for some of the capabilities uh, and some of the behavior that the DPRK uh, has uh, exhibited uh, in cyberspace. So it is not just uh, the DPRK's ballistic missile and nuclear weapons program programs. It is, uh, it is not just its uh, record on human rights. Uh, there are other uh, profound concerns we have uh, including uh, its behavior in cyberspace. Yes, Ben. Um, um, with, the with the restoration of the sanctions waiver uh, on Iran, which is akin to lifting sanctions in the sense that it enriches them to a certain degree. No, it does not, Ben. <laughs> but was but that it, that's not true. It does not do that. W well, was the restoration of, san of the sanctions waiver in any way an incentive to get them back to the table and continue negotiations? Uh, so to be very clear, what, what you said was, was not true. Um, the, uh, the issuance of the so-called IFCA waiver in no way uh, in, enriches Iran. This is about uh, two things. Uh, this is about nuclear non-proliferation uh, and nuclear safety. Uh, I um, would suspect uh, most reasonable observers would uh, agree that both of these things are in our vital uh, national interest regardless of what happens uh, with the JCPOA, if we're able to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA, uh, or if we're not. Uh, we decided to renew uh, and to restore uh, this sanctions waiver uh, to do one thing, and that is to enable third-party participation in nuclear non-proliferation and safety projects uh, in Iran, owing to the growing uh, proliferation concerns we have uh, in particular with respect to uh, the increasing stockpiles of enriched uranium uh, in Iran, the stockpiles that have grown uh, following the last administration's decision to uh, abandon the JCPOA. Absent uh, this waiver, the sort of detailed uh, technical discussions with third parties regarding the disposition of stockpiles and other activities of, uh, of non-proliferation value, they, they couldn't take place. Uh, the Trump administration, uh, as you know, uh, provided a similar waiver for years, uh, even after its uh, foolish decision to leave the JCPOA, uh, precisely because the last administration recognized uh, the nonproliferation uh, value of these waivers. I don't know that I've quoted uh, Secretary Pompeo before from here, um, but Secretary Pompeo said uh, about this waiver, quote, this decision will help reduce proliferation risks. Um, so additionally, the technical discussions uh, facilitated uh, by the waiver are necessary in the final weeks of JCPOA talks, uh, as the waiver itself would be essential if we were be in a position to be in a position to, um, uh, if Iran were to resume uh, compliance with its uh, nuclear commitments. But again, even if talks uh, do not culminate uh, in a mutual return to compliance, these sorts of technical discussions could still contribute uh, to our non-proliferation uh, goals. Uh, non-proliferation, nuclear safety, these things may not uh, mean a lot to a whole lot of people. So just to give you a, a few of examples of uh, activities that these waivers, this waiver would cover. Um, for example, the modernization of the Iraq reactor uh, based on the design approved uh, by the JCPOA uh, the uh, conversion uh, of the reactor, reactor to a much less proliferation sensitive design. Uh, this waiver uh, would approve the preparation and modification of the Fordow facility for stable isotope production. Uh, it would remove a potential impediment to efforts to end uranium enrichment at Fordow, uh, as Iran committed to do under the JCPOA. It would facilitate the transfer outside of Iran of enriched uranium uh, to uh, uh, result in a reduction in Iran's stockpile to no more than 300 kilograms 
of up to 3.67% uh, enriched LEU. I, I could go on, but the point is uh, that this waiver is not about providing Iran uh, with funds. This waiver is about uh, what is manifestly uh, in our non-proliferation interests, uh, in our um, uh, in, in service of uh, non-proliferation safety uh, to the United States, uh, to our partners and allies around the world. Can you talk about the timing of it, though, and why the decision was taken on Friday? Well, if it had anything to do with... You know, well, the, the fact is, if we are in a position to so, yeah. resume compliance with the JCPOA, this waiver will need to be in place in order to affect uh, some of the steps to make Iran's nuclear program less dangerous. If we are not in a position to uh, achieve a mutual return to compliance, uh, these are still, these steps are still in our interest. What makes you think that that next step, that they are, that we're one step closer to rejoining the JCPOA? I didn't say that we were. I'm saying that this prepares us uh, in the event we are able to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. This could still very much go uh, one of two ways. Uh, a mutual return to compliance if Iran uh, is in a position and willing and able to make the sort of political commitments necessary, or the alternatives uh, that we've talked about in some less deal, uh, detail, but that we still talked about. That, that long list of things that you said that these waivers give, you're saying that there's no benefit to Iran in any of that? Uh, I am saying that the the net benefit of this is a non-proliferation benefit Iran, for Iran us. Get, Iran gets nothing out of it? When you say uh, sanctions I'm not waiver, talking about, hold on a second. Matt, you don't well, need to raise your voice. You're, you're the one, who, you're, you guys are the ones who said you were restoring the waivers, right? Okay? So, if Iran really gets no benefit at all out of this, then, you know, what, what, why even bother? Why bother? I, I just explained to Ben because... I, no, if, well, you... T t tell me why Iran doesn't benefit from this. I, Matt, this is something that you're talking don't... about. You're talking about. You're 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 ex assuming that everyone thinks that a, that sanctions relief equals dollars. Well, that was the question. Going he, the question was Iran. you just waved. no. He, it was that wasn't really the question. Was. That was the way you interpreted the question. You can refer so to sanctions the relief does not necessarily mean only dollar bills flying across the table into Iran, in, into the into the Iranian treasury's coffers does it or is in in this case uh, it will allow Iran to undertake nuclear non-proliferation and safety yeah, which activities is a benefit that, that would for, otherwise be to prescribed. Iran that it was that it was not getting before the 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 fact is Matt, that what is in our non-proliferation interest uh, can also be in some ways in Iran's interest. That doesn't change the fact that it is manifestly they, in so our interest. So do they interest. get it? Do they get a benefit? Matt, or not? I was referring to. Do they the get any benefit out of this or not? It, it is some of these steps do, were down do, to do their they interest. Do they get any benefit or not? It, this is in our interest to do, which is precisely is why the Iran's last, which is why the well? last administration did it in 2018. Secretary okay. Pompeo, as I quoted before. Uh, said precisely, yeah. this decision will and help two reduce years proliferation later, And two risks. years later, yes. when he rescinded the waivers, he said that he accused Iran of, taking, of participating in nuclear blackmail and said that, 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 they weren't, uh, that they weren't deserving of the benefits that accrue to them under this. You're stuck on this idea that, and you interesting that you use the word enrich, because I think you're talking about it in terms of money, but enrichment obviously has a different kind of meaning when it comes to Iran. But I, 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 I don't understand how you can say that, that Iran gets no benefit and that this isn't some kind of uh, sanctions relief that, you, that the administration has offered to Iran before it has made any of its own concessions. Matt, the question I was responding to took this Okay, in the well then forget about the yeah. question you, were, you think you were responding to. Answer my question. Does Iran benefit at all from the waivers that you, were signed. You, you will need to ask the Iranian government whether they think this is a benefit to them. Well, who do we you know, think this benefits? We Just know you? this is a benefit to us. The, the, the ability of third party entities to work on that nuclear be... non proliferation projects, okay, I'm sorry, nuclear is, safety is projects US, in Iran, is... in the face of our growing concerns, non proliferation and nuclear safety concerns, that is in our benefit. Yes. Um, the people that this benefits, in fact, are actually Russian, Chinese, European companies. Right? Is that what you're saying? Matt, I'm saying that it is manifestly to our advantage. And, a, it, and, not, it, and not Iran's. It benefits us uh, to okay. be well, able to address nuclear that, safety and nuclear non-proliferation concerns. If you're able to argue that Iran gets no benefit out of this successfully, which you haven't convinced me of, but anyway, it, but if you're able to, then good on you. Now, do you think that this 
um, these waivers trigger uh, Inara? Uh, Matt, we have a robust conversation with uh, Congress on uh, progress in Vienna. Uh, we, you know, have briefed Congress regularly on um, uh, on the discussions. I uh, have every expectations that uh, those briefings will continue in the days and weeks ahead. Well, do, do you believe that this triggers the, the requirements of the Iran Nuclear Review Act? Uh, what I can say is that we've had conversations with Congress uh, about uh, requirements. Should we be in a position to? Uh, resume uh, compliance with the JCPOA, uh, but I, I don't have anything for you on these uh, on these particular uh, this IFCA. Uh, no, not IFCA, Inara. Right, but you, you're the, saying the, these in re, in response to IFCA. Yeah. 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 Well, so you're aware yes. of the requirements of Inara, right? So any agreement reached with Iran has to be submitted. Are, are you saying that it did trigger Inara, and your notification to Congress on Friday fulfills the requirements of Inara? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying. Oh well, then why did you even notify Congress in the first place? We regularly notify Congress <laughs> when, it, okay, when well, it comes to. So did it trigger an R or not? Matt, when it, we will carefully consider the facts and circumstances when it comes to any potential U.S. return to uh, the JCPOA to determine the implications under an ARA. Uh, so you don't think that this falls under the scope of Inara? I, I have no reason to believe that uh, this was done pursuant to Inara. Uh, this is something we, as I said before, we regularly engage with Congress uh, uh, when it comes to developments in Vienna. Right, well, it's a technical issue. I get that, and it, and it probably boring the hell out of everybody. But it is an important one because if you, if it, even if even if the notification wasn't done under Inara, do you think that the waivers trigger? The to trigger the Inara requirements for any agreement with Iran related to its nuclear program. These, this, these do relate to its nuclear program, this right? Is, this is, as you said, a technical question, so we'll get you a technical answer. Thank you. Hey, you know, why shouldn't Iran benefit? Why shouldn't Iran benefit uh, from the waiver? I mean, I thought the whole purpose of negotiation is so everybody goes back to the deal and, uh, you know, sanctions will be lifted, Iran will pull back from any nuclear threat and so on, and everything will be hunky-dory. So why is that such a bad thing if Iran benefits? Uh, you'll have to ask. No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking <laughs> you because, you know, you, you, you Matt, know. I, I am not speaking to what Iran yeah, may be saying about this. I am speaking to the benefits we the, accrue. Isn't that the incentive? Uh, for Iran to go on, you know, in good faith in these negotiations? Well, the, the basic formula of the JCPOA, leaving aside, uh, you know, Matt's questioning about uh, these specific uh, measures, uh, is in fact permanent verifiable limits on Iran's nuclear program in return for sanctions relief. Do you have any indication that you're talking to Iran tomorrow that um, mm. the Iranian negotiators are coming back? empowered by the political decision decision you were expecting for we will we will have a better idea of that once the talks resume yeah um, i understand will be in vienna for an osce meeting tomorrow will she meet with the u.s iran team at, at any of the p5 plus one or even the iranians she's there? taking part virtually okay thanks thank you all very much so uh, okay is sure the, are, the, are the russians taking a little bit longer to respond to this the u.s proposal than anticipated You'll have to ask them. No uh, sense of any indigestion as they're uh, processing. Uh, this, you will. You written. will have to ask them about their gastrointestinal fortitude. <laughs> yeah. Can you just tell us what the focus call is about? Um, on the next so we'll have an opportunity. I, I do expect we'll have a, a readout of the call, but uh, in advance of the secretary's travel to uh, the Indo-Pacific, this is just another opportunity for him to uh, uh, have a conversation with our uh, AUKUS partners. Uh, they will, uh, I suspect, uh, discuss the, the work currently underway uh, and the progress made in the implementation of some of the initiatives uh, that we have talked about uh, in the context uh, of AUKUS. I don't want to get ahead of, uh, of that readout, but I think you will see one it, later. It's the first follow-up at this level since AUKUS was uh, announced, right? It's been, it's been several months. Yes, Ben. Um, do you have any comments on China using a Uyghur um, to light the Olympic flame and uh no, not, not specifically, beyond the point that we've repeatedly made, uh, that the PRC uh, has sought to, uh, this, the PRC has sought to disguise uh, the true reality uh, of what is going on, uh, what has gone on in Xinjiang. Uh, that is the ongoing genocide. Uh, those are the crimes against humanity. That's the human rights abuses uh, that have taken place there. Uh, but 
when it comes to their motives for uh, choosing uh, this specific individual, I'd have to refer you to them. Yes. Will Rob Maui be in Vienna tomorrow for the third time? He is, he is traveling to Vienna today. Thank you all very much.